Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, August 16th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We got two interesting diaries today to start out with regarding some new tricks that Malware is up to. First one is aptly named TrickBot, and as Brad explains, it's sort of a newer version of the Dire or Diresa Malware family. Now, the overall infection doesn't really look all that special. Starts out with spam that includes an HTML link that then is used to trick the user to download an Office document, which of course will use macros to infect the system with additional malware. What gets a little bit interesting is, first of all, the domains used. Yesterday, I mentioned how we see a lot of these new top-level domains being used, and that's pretty easy to spot. This particular sample did use the more traditional .com and then also .co.uk, so the standard commercial British domain. And then I think most interesting from my point of view was that the sample actually used HTTPS on the websites that hosted the malicious Word document. Also, the email came from these domains and these domains were configured with the standard SPF and such features in order to make it more likely to have the email accepted by spam filters. So whoever is behind it uh, went the extra mile to make sure that First of all, the spam is getting delivered. And secondly, it makes it a little bit more difficult to actually inspect the traffic since it's using HTTPS. A lot of organizations still don't really inspect HTTPS requests. The end effect of all of this is that you will end up with a system that's infected with the TrickBot banking trojan, which as the name implies, will go after your online banking sessions. Now, TrickBot, while it did some pretty interesting things here, it still relied on spam in order to spread itself. Renato has another example here of malware that actually didn't use spam. Instead, the hacker actually called specific individuals and tricked them into installing a browser plugin over the phone. Of course, browser plugins have wide access to everything the browser does. In this case, it was a Chrome plugin. There typically written for Chrome in JavaScript. Sadly, the JavaScript extension has zero hits at this point in virus total, so it's likely going to fly under the radar. Once the browser extension is installed, it will exfiltrate credentials. Uh, the one example that Renato had, the bank even uses uh, one of those on-screen keyboards that are supposed to make it more difficult to actually intercept keystrokes. But well, once your browser extension, you can just grab the request that's being sent to the bank. And in this case, that's just a base64 encoded version of the username and password. Overall, I'm not really sure how many problems these on-screen keyboards actually solve these days uh, because a lot of uh, the malware that I have been seeing because of banking malware for a long time does the man in the browser attack where they don't rely on any direct keyboard sniffing. They really just look at the requests and responses going to the bank and coming back from it. Now, I keep talking a lot about Android malware. Of course, one of the protections that uh, Apple is always touting for iOS is its App Store and that it's quite difficult to sneak malware past its controls. Well, uh, one way that has uh, been proven to work in the past is to essentially upload an application into the App Store that will later modify itself and download additional components in order to add malicious functions. As a result, Apple has removed a lot of applications from the App Store that have implemented some of these tricks in the past. One particular popular framework here was JS Patch. Well, it turns out there's still at least one popular application that uses JS Patch, and that appears to be the DJI Throne Go application. This is an application that you commonly use in order to control your DJI drone. 
No malicious use of this framework has been spotted in the particular application, but they definitely managed to sneak it past Apple's controls somehow. When it comes to the Internet of Things, then one of the techniques that has always been proposed and pushed for these devices is some form of auto update. And I have to say, I'm a fan of this, given the large number of these devices, any kind of human interaction in order to update this device is probably not realistic. Well, uh, but with that, it's up to the manufacturer to actually make sure that the updates work. At least one manufacturer hasn't got it quite right, and that's LockSafe. LockSafe makes internet connected locks, and they recently did an over the air automatic firmware update, which apparently failed in many cases, leaving customers with non functional locks, which probably is not a reason why these locks typically have a mechanical override. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening, and Talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.